Good afternoon, everyone. Schönen guten Tag. Um, I see that the numbers of our viewers are still going up, so therefore I will just keep talking a little bit and introduce the housekeeping rules for this webinar. As usual, we are recording this public webinar, so in case you want to ask a question later on, we will only use your first name, but you might want to um, rename yourself because when you take the floor, your name will be visible. Um, also, we will, I will just run you through the agenda briefly, but as long as you do not have the floor and you will be given the floor maybe later on, please do keep your microphones on mute and also any disturbing noises um, when we are coming to this later. Um, I'm very happy that to this afternoon we have a fairly large audience for an issue which is unfortunately not at the top of the political, political agenda as much as I would like to have it, which is of course biodiversity. Many people know about the climate crisis, but not so many know about the biodiversity crisis, although it is at least as um, catastrophical or maybe as catastrophical in outcome as the climate crisis. Um, we will this afternoon explore, I would say the biggest European nature protection project, which is the European Green Belt. I'm very happy that my colleagues, Nicole Stefanuta and I um, could achieve together that we could hand in a pilot project to the European budget with this pilot project, which we will talk to you later on, the European Green Belt will be supported. Um, to run to the agenda, through the agenda very briefly, we will start with a presentation by Gabriel Schwaderer from, from Euronatur. Uh, Euronatur is an, a European association that is working on the issues of, climate, of nature protection, has been doing so quite a long time and um, is very well connected in the countries that uh, run along the green belt, the former Iron Curtain. Then we will have Jakub Skorowski from Gaia in Poland. And I'm very happy to have you with us, Jakub, because you will be able to, to tell us hands-on, so to speak, on your experiences in the work in Poland, in the at the Baltic Sea, so to speak. Wow. Then we have Sofia Gal Galciava, I'm not sure whether I have pronounce it correctly, from Romania, and she's a speleoecologist, and you will tell us all about caves, I believe, <laughs> or maybe not no. only about caves. <laughs> no, we'll see. And um, then Nico and I, and thanks Nico for joining, your, your um, image is a bit torted, maybe you could try to get it to get to turn it by 90 degrees, that would be great. We will tell you about our pilot project, Best Belt, the best for the green belt. And after that, we will have the Honorable Stefan Leiner from the European Commission, who is work has been working for ages, I think, on, on nature protection in Brussels. And he will be joined by by Carol Martinez from the International Union of, for the Conservation of Nature. Thank you very much, Carol, for joining us today. And um, without further ado, I would like to welcome again, everyone. Again, this webinar is being recorded. So rename yourself to Mickey Mouse or something if you don't want anyone to see your real name. And I would like to give the floor now to Gabriel, you have prepared a few slides and you will tell us about the importance of yeah hello um everyone uh, good afternoon um thank you very much um uh, yuta uh, for the introduction and uh, thank you and um, Nico very much for um, setting up this uh, webinar uh, th this afternoon about the European Greenbelt. Um, my task is to 
to set the scene and, and to introduce you all uh, to the European Green Belt and, and what it's all about and, and why it's so important. Um, and um, yeah, the, the European Green Belt, it ranges from the very north to the very south of Europe. It's an ecological network of, of outstanding importance due to its um, high potential for ecological connectivity. And it's a, it's a backbone um, of uh, green infrastructure uh, for Europe. It's also a, a model area for uh, conservation and restoration of biodiversity and of um, the functionality of ecological networks. And we think it's also very important uh, to, to respect while restoring and conserving nature, economic, social and cultural needs of local communities. The, the European Green Belt can serve as a framework for cross-border cooperation and it offers many opportunities for sustainable development, especially in peripheral areas of Europe. The European Green Belt, the former Iron Curtain, it's um, 12,500 kilometers long. It uh, ranges um, uh, um, through eight biogeographic regions. It uh, connects 24 countries in Europe and it has more than 7,500 protected areas, and it comprises wilderness, cultural landscapes, water ecosystem, threatened species. And there is also the historic dimension. It has been a death zone during the Cold War. And then when the Iron Curtain fell in 89, this was a starting point for the Iron Curtain to, to develop to a lifeline. And that is what we, we have today, the European Green Belt. Here are some um, well, important dates, but I'm not um, going through them all. You can uh, see the slides also later on. Um, but important is that in 2019, the uh, Green Belt, the European Green Belt, celebrated 30 years of joint action for this um, memorable landscape and also for this great nature project. The European Green Belt provides very important services. So it's not only about nature, but it's also about people. Um, the, um, beside ecological values, it also has outstanding cultural values and it stands out with its ecosystem services. They are comparatively high um, to other areas. And also when it comes to connectivity, um, the European Green Belt really stands out and it has a very high potential for sustainable local and regional development. In, in that sense, it, it offers many opportunities for local and I would say here green jobs um, because they are in the field of um, sustainable forestry agriculture and also and that is what we see here as a big potential um, green tourism. There are as well opportunities for environmental education for scientific work etc and if we um, take all this together we think that the European Green Belt uh, should be nominated as a World Heritage Site because we see really that it has the potential to be inscribed on the World Heritage List. I would like to talk very briefly about the European Green Belt Initiative because behind all this European Green Belt there are a lot of people working for this and they are um, connected in this European Green Belt Initiative. This is a very wide range of, of NGOs and GOs and expert groups in all these 24 countries. And the aim is to um, harmonize um, the, the protection conservation efforts all along the European Green Belt. And it stands for joint efforts towards cross-border um, activities on a European level. And the European Green Belt Initiative operates at different levels. I think that is very important. We have a local level and, and that is very crucial. And this is the heart of the European Green Belt. All the, the people and projects on the local level working for um, 
improving ecological connectivity, but also working towards local sustainable development. And then we have the regional level, you see uh, four sections we have separated because these sections, they also differ a bit in terms of um, ecology, climate, habitats, etc. Uh, so we think it's also very good to have this regional level and it reflects a diversity and it also offers as a very good platform for exchange and common action. And then we have the pan-European dimension and that adds to the local and to the regional levels. Um, in 2014, this initiative formalized itself a bit and the European Greenbelt Association has been um, established. Currently, um, the European Greenbelt Association has more than 30 organizations representing 17 countries. And it's a, it's, um, a legal umbrella structure to ensure uh, coordination and information exchange among the European Greenbelt community. And um, yeah, all the other things you can read here, I don't need to, to go more into the details. Just to share with you the vision of this um, association, um, we want to um, uh, work towards uh, European Greenbelt, which is our shared natural heritage along the line of the former Iron Curtain, and is to be conserved and restored to function as um, an ecological network connecting high value natural and cultural landscapes whilst respecting the economic, social and cultural needs of local communities. And what are the opportunities that the European Greenbelt offers? Um, well, with its natural values and um, its uh, great ability to deliver on ecosystem goods and services, the European Greenbelt deserves um, the, its conservation as a trans-European biodiversity network. Uh, the, the European Greenbelt stands out as a memorial landscape. And in fact, it's also a peace project. It's not only about nature, it's also about people. And the, the outstanding natural and cultural values qualify the European Greenbelt to be nominated as a World Heritage Site. Well, many areas along the European Greenbelt, they actually represent the periphery of Europe. And uh, these areas, they, they also struggle with um, many challenges like uh, lack of em employment opportunities, um, and people leaving these areas. So we see the European Green Belt also as a, as a concept which offers opportunities for green jobs and local development. Uh, significant funding would very much help to boost uh, these potentials um, in terms of ecological connectivity and also in terms of local sustainable development. Yeah, the European Green Belt is not only about nature, but also about people. And in fact, the European Green Belt has not only um, the potential to really contribute a lot to um, biodiversity conservation, to achieve objectives um, outlined also in the EU biodiversity strategy and, and other policies, but it has also the potential to foster European integration. And we think that is very important in a period where we sometimes focus too much on what, what um, is, is, is different and, and why we should go <clears throat> our own way than um, connect ourselves. We envision a bright unified future where all people can explore the unique history, culture and natural wonder of the European Greenbelt. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Gabriel, for this very comprehensive introduction. And I must admit, I 
I have known for a very, very long time about the Grünes Band Deutschland, the German part of the Green Belt, but it took me quite a while to realize that this is a really a European project. Um, I forgot half of my housekeeping rules, very sorry. Anyone who wants to um, ask a question, we will have a discussion and question and answer session after we have had all the presentations, but you could all, of course, already put your questions in the question and answer part, which is labeled F and A on my screen, at least. And there you can also um, give, a, give approval to questions that you find important in so that we actually can um, can rank them if there are many questions. Um, and also you could, of course, put messages in the chat, but I would like to um, remind you that it's much easier for us to have the questions sorted when they're in the question and answer tool. And yes, Laura has also posted the um, link for the European Green Belt um, website in the chat. So if you want to check that out, you're of course invited. So now we come from the big overview, so to speak, to the work on the ground. And I'm very happy that Jakob is with us and he also has some slides, I believe. Or are you going to hold up the paper in your hand? No, you're not. Great. I will do both, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so please do scare your, share your screen. OK, can you see my presentation? Okay, perfect. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me here and thank you for uh, giving this opportunity to share with you uh, a brief information about the uh, Baltic section of the European Green Belt. Uh, this Baltic Green Belt uh, stretches along southern coast of uh, the Baltic Sea. Uh, it is characterized by a very diverse um, marine underwater um, uh, and land habitats, uh, richly variegated uh, with um, a coastline with large dune fields, uh, beaches, uh, moraine cliffs, uh, brackish lagoons and wetlands. Uh, due to poorly uh, developed tourism sector or relatively poorly developed um, tourism sector and extensive military um, grounds, many coastal areas served in the past as reserves for migrating birds uh, and many marine animals such as grey uh, and ringed seals. But since uh, early 1990s, uh, the coastline has experienced heavy pressure uh, for development and exploitation and thus, thus safeguarding the valuable natural and historical assets um, of this um, attractive and heavily sought after landscape poses a major, a major challenge for the Baltic Green Belt. If it comes to um, member organizations of the European Green Belt Association operating in this area, we have three of them. There is the Green Federation Gaia, my organization. It's a Polish NGO funded in 1993, uh, focusing on species and habitat conservation, but also promotion of sustainable agriculture, agriculture and supporting the development of a civil society. We have also, uh, and now I have to ask the German participants to excuse me, I will try to pronounce it uh, correctly, BUND um, uh, für Umwelt und Naturschutz Deutschland, uh, the mecklenburg vorpommern uh, brand. Uh, BUND is a German grassroots NGO funded in 1975 involved in the policy making processes um, on environmental issues, uh, climate, transport, chemicals, um, renewable energy support, agriculture, sustainable lifestyle, sustainable consumptions, and many more. Uh, there is also last but not least, the Latvian Green Movement, um, a Latvian NGO and environmental NGO 
established in 2004, uh, focusing on uh, climate issues, uh, sustainable e energy, sustainable coastal development, and support of local initiatives um, and campaigns for improved environmental quality. Within the Baltic Green Belt, uh, we are conserving coastal habitats, um, both above and below uh, waterline, uh, exemplified by the project run by uh, the Latvian Green Movement, uh, entitled Safe Latvian Dunes. The project addresses the problem of the lack of infrastructure supporting sustainable tourism, uh, and as a consequence, the illegal intensive touristic exploitation of beaches uh, resulting in car and motorbikes running over dunes. The project has managed to arrange a number of activities to improve the situation by closing illegal roads, but also collecting garbage or building the necessary tourist, uh, touristic infrastructure. Another uh, important uh, initiative in the region run by the Green Federation Gaia focuses on protection uh, of the rack line, uh, which is a line of organic uh, debris, uh, debris left on the beach by the action of waves. Uh, such accumulation uh, of organic matter deposit, uh, deposits on the beaches is seen by tourists, uh, but also by beach managers like local municipalities as unwanted and bothersome litter that needs to be simply removed. And indeed, uh, most often it is removed as part of beach cleaning activities uh, and then disposed uh, on, uh, of um, in landfills. Meanwhile, uh, the rack line is very valuable and very important uh, habitat, serving as feeding uh, ground for many invertebrate and bird species, but also as a resting place for uh, seals. The rack line uh, also plays an important role in fertilizing the sand dune uh, habitats poor in nutrients and then linking habitats uh, on land and at sea. In this context, uh, it is uh, very important to make beach uh, users and managers aware of the important ecological role uh, of this habitat and to create zones um, free from tourist, uh, tourist traffic where organic matter can accumulate. Uh, and play its uh, important ecological role. Another important activity concerns reconstruction of uh, diverse uh, diversity of our reverse bed morphology uh, by arranging natural rapids and stream pools, uh, which improve status of the coastal riverine habitats relatively the richest in fish species. Uh, restoration of natural diversity of the rivers bed morphology leads to improvement of disturbed ecological connectivity, uh, very important uh, or of key importance for salmonid fish, uh, as well as for self purification capacity of small coastal rivers. Uh, Important activity also con conducted in the region addressed the problem of uh, or the issue of endangered species, uh, especially those uh, semi-aquatic and non-charismatic species, uh, thus not popular like European mink and noble crayfish. Uh, and if it comes to European mink, um, um, which is listed as critically endangered, but in the same time, uh, there is a lack of public awareness about the alarming situation of the spe species and then uh, very low uh, public interest in protecting the species. And to address this problem, the Euro European Mink Center has been recently launched uh, an internet platform dedicated to popularization of the idea of species protection uh, creation of favorable conditions for its protection in the public space. And then, if it comes to challenges and chances, 
uh, the most urgent problems faced by the Baltic Green uh, Belt um, is for sure large and growing pressure of tourism uh, on coastal areas. A very timely problem also due to a coronavirus pandemic preventing tourists from uh, foreign travels and focusing tourism uh, on domestic tourist destinations. And currently, most activities are run uh, within the Baltic Green Belt uh, are of in-kind character, um, including regional coordination, which is uh, also a major limitation. There are also limited means for on-site consulting, as well as need for more joint activities like knowledge transfer and experience sharing, trainings, collaborative site work, and last but not least, uh, a need for professionalization um, uh, uh, should also be mentioned, uh, mainly in communication and awareness raising about the Baltic Green Belt or the Green Belt Initiative itself, protected areas and ecosystem services. And just uh, at the end, very shortly, I wanted to say something about um, activities undertaken uh, by um, Central European session, uh, section of uh, the Green Belt. Um, um, here we have uh, biological uh, diversity and climate protection, restoration of wetlands, uh, mires and species rich grasslands, um, empowerment of civil society and sustainable tourism by support of sustainable bicycle tourism set up of environmental friendly tourism structures and empowerment of civil society uh, as well as valorization of natural and cultural heritage and environmental education um, here we have support of regional development like local and regional agricultural products environmental education activities and transboundary public relation work for instance, the Green Belt exhibition. Very briefly, that's, that's, that, that's all. Uh, of course, we have uh, much more to say if it comes to this very unique section of the um, Green Belt. Um, if you wish here we have, um, if you wish contact with us uh, here, you have uh, contact details, but of course I will stay now also for the discussion part. So uh, you may also address some questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jakob, for these interesting insights into the on the ground work, which is often challenging. I know I think it is the same in all in all countries, even in richer countries like Germany, the on the ground work is quite strenuous and um, people tend to have not uh, enough financial re resources and also not enough support. So you're not alone there if, if this is comforting in any way. <laughs> I'm very glad that Nico Stefanuta is now with us because he did have some connection problems. I think Nico, hey, good to see you, you and thank you so much for this, for the wonderful work on this project. I'm really glad that we could do this together and um we will we will not be talking right now because first it's sophia's part to present us um her insights sophia is from romania so now we are going from the Bal baltic sea to the balkans and i'm very um curious on your insights on the green belt go ahead so hello my name is sophia and I'm mainly going to be talking about my own organization and how we work with the Green Belt and how it helps us. But as you all know, there are other organizations and countries involved in the Balkanic region. So can you see my screen? Not yet. Not uh, yet. Um, you have to go on, on yeah. screen sharing and then you, ha you have to skip yourself to to your presentation because else ah yeah now we are seeing it great great so right here uh, you can see a map of the green belt which you very well know and in the red circle you see the romanian serbian border 
which is basically our sector of the Green Belt. The border has a length of over 500 kilometers of dry land and of wetland, the Danube River. It goes through three counties, Timish County, Karoseverin, and Nehedin, through numerous towns and villages, and also has a population of over 200,000 people. Here you have a map of the protected areas. So we have 21 protected areas of national importance, 20 protected areas which are important at European level, with 17 sites of community importance and three AV fauna special protection areas, and also two protected areas of international importance. In terms of administration, there is the National Agency for Protected Natural Areas, which is a state public institution, Romsilva, which is a state economic entity, and Mehedinsk County Council. In terms of challenges and opportunities from the perspective of the Green Belt, you will see that both are relatively numerous. So the problems would be the expansion of residential ensembles along the Danube, virgin forest exploitation, excessive hunting, excessive fishing with illegal methods, mining pollution, leftover materials from mining exploitation, wastewater pollution, as well as improper wastewater management and waste management practices. But on the other hand, the area is very wild. It has 310 kilometers of borderland with limited human access due to border regulations. There is a lot of wild karstic environment which is difficult to access, islands that aren't visited by people, caves that are difficult to access. And also there is some state-owned land which could be declared a protected area in the future. And we also have the European Union strategy for the expansion and strict safeguarding of natural protected areas, which is very beneficial for us. Our organization has a very, lo very long history of six years of activity. It started as an informal group of friends who went caving and later it became an association. It entered the Romanian for Alpine Climbing. It became an NGO. It became a member of the Romanian Spelological Federation, a member of the UCN, and a member of the European Green Belt Association. We also have numerous achievements because it had such a long life. We have studied about 15% of all the caves in Romania. About uh, 1,650 caves have been discovered and researched and over 110 kilometers of mapped galleries. We have worked on the depollution of caves, restoration, preservation. We have had over 50 projects, partnerships through life and nature. We have 50 partners and collaborators, which are institutions and associations for nature conservation. And we collaborate with associations from Germany, Poland, the Czech Republic, Belgium, Hungary, and Serbia. We have had multiple financing resources. And our largest amount has been of over 800,000 euros, which was obtained through the LIFE program. Because it had such a long life, we also managed to organize a center for the study and protection of karst, a center for education and promotion of tourism in the Green Belt. We have had the initiative to build a speleological museum in Oravica. We have organized numerous courses on organization project writing, strategic development, how to start in caving, karstology, geology, conservation biospeology, speleology, and we have also organized numerous congresses and conferences. Here you can see two maps. The first one is spilio tourism on the Greenbelt area between Romania and Serbia. And the second one, the white one, is a part of our 2020 project, which here is to make a map of the karstic area in Romania. 
Also, we have worked on spillio tourism in the Greenbelt area, on protecting biodiversity in the Balkans, on strengthening cooperation along the Balkan Greenbelt. We have held the Balkan Greenbelt Regional Conference in 2016 and also worked on the Greenbelt Day Celebration Project in 2017. In terms of recent projects, we had between 2014 and up to present day a conservation project for habitat in Nera Beushnica Nature 2000 site. Here, the budget was of over 800,000 euros, with 50% 50 50 coming from the European Commission, Commun Commission for the Life Program and 50% from the Romanian government. The objectives were the rehabilitation of 110 cavities, which were degraded or polluted, conservation of 14 chiroptera species, development of best practices for the management of the habitat at regional, national, and European level, and disseminating information throughout 15 local communities and among conservation specialists. Also in terms of recent projects, this is our 2020 project, bringing the Romanian caves to light. And the objectives were to do an analysis of the current law within five aforementioned states. So we basically compared and compiled laws of different states in order to, to promote a legal framework for the Romanian caves and to create a platform where speleologists can receive legal assistance. Also, the results of our work has been disseminated among 42 NGOs. So our plans for the future are to identify ecosystems, natural sites, cultural and anthropic landmarks, and to create a database to conserve areas that necessitate strict protection, to apply the use strategy for biodiversity with strict protection on the border, to extend national network of protected areas, and also to extend the Nature 2000 network of dryland border area in the Timish County. We also want to depollute the wetlands and water courses, to depollute the mining waste areas, and to restore the degraded habitats, the water floods, flood plains, rocky areas, and so on. So it isn't just about caves. And because we collaborate with so many different institutions and associations, we can access up specialized information from outside of our association as needed. We also aim to raise awareness to create information campaigns for all the local authorities to produce material, information material, meaning maps, atlases, photography albums, guides, to create a website for the Romanian Serbian Green Belt, and to create campaigns for young people of school age in local communities. Also want to celebrate the Green Belt Day, to organize cross-border events on topics of science, culture, and conservation, to develop cross-border sector-level collaborations and to distribute promotion materials through the local information centers. Lastly, our aims are to do some qualitative assessment of groundwater and surface water and qualitative and quantitative assessment of the landscape and to create sustainable development by organizing the tourist landmarks, the caves, the waterfalls, and create some themed trails, and to train local guides to be able to show people the area in terms of nature, culture, caving, and so on. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much, Sophia. That was very interesting. I must admit, I'm not so much of a of a caver, so to speak, because I always think, oh God, I might get lost. I will never find out again. I will die from thirst and hunger in here. So um, I'm only on the visitor side, so to speak. But thank you very much. And I think you already showed us a lot of 
initiatives and um, potential activities to actually improve the green belt. Maybe one or two of our listeners have asked themselves, well, why did they even get on this project? And um, I would like to explain from my side what is behind this idea, and then I will pass over to Nico. Shortly after I had started my term in the European Parliament in 2019, I was approached by Gabriel, and he suggested that we could may that we could host an event in the European Parliament to inform people about the Green Belt, the European Green Belt, given the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the start of the whole project, so to speak. And this became the starting point for this project. This Break, parliamentary breakfast, which uh, we organized. I mean, being German, I know very well about the history of the Iron Curtain and the death and the sorrow which it caused, but life and death are often intertwined. And as we have heard, the so-called death zones along the Iron Curtain have created a safe space for nature to regenerate and now the green belt connects this unique continuity of natural habitats, which span, span a length, um, the length of our continent, more than 12,000 kilometers. And I think this huge symbolic power, that's something that we really should make use of. To connect, which should be together as the European motto, united in diversity. And this is true for nature and for the EU. When it comes to green infrastructure in Europe, the Green Belt is our flagship, but it is also vulnerable to threats. Most of the threats are caused by humans. We have heard of settlement expansion, road construction, intensive agriculture, unsustainable tourism, overfishing, overhunting, and of course, climate change. And everyone who wants to know more about the state of the nature, I can really recommend the state of the nature report, which the European Environment Agency published last year. So we have already heard many protected species need safe spaces in order to have a place where can, they can regenerate, where they can um, have their partners um, nurture their cubs and spaces where there is no noise and no pollution. But which is very important if a species is already endangered, most the genetic variety is also limited. And in order to not um, diminish this variety further, those habitats have to be connected because the species need to be able to migrate. And that's the unique opportunity that we really have with a green belt that we have these safe corridors for traveling. Um, last year, the European Commission published the biodiversity strategy, which we already heard about, and uh, we hope that our project can bring some life into the strategy. Of course, it is already full of life, but this project could really become a, a lighthouse project, um, because we have now learned the hard way with the still ongoing pandemic that the destruction of biodiversity will come back to haunt us. Um, in that regard, the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystems um, held a workshop last year in July and they published a report and showed that by further diminishing biodiversity, we might enter into an age of pandemics. So, I can only emphasize nature is our lifeline and therefore we have to protect it and we must address biodiversity and climate crisis together. And we hope that this project will help to support the conservation of biodiversity and sustainable use of ecosystem services. There are many good initiatives along the green, European Green Belt. We could only present um, two of them today because else we would have had to hold the webinar for the whole day. And, um, but what we are seeing is often these initiatives need funding, even for small pro projects, uh, the necessary means can be difficult to find. And therefore we hope that our pilot project can stimulate and support the already existing work and ideas on the ground. And I'm very happy that we will have a synergy even with um, the, predecessor project, so to speak, the Iron Curtain Trail, which is a bike trail running also along the former 
former Iron Curtain and um, Green MEP Michael Kramer, who was member of parliament until 2019, um, dedicated many years for the completion of this Iron Curtain bike, bike trail. And um, you can also have a look at the Iron Curtain bike, tra bike trail on the homepage. Um, I will post the, the website in the chat. We know that this best belt, which we handed in now as pilot project, will start with small steps, but every single step counts. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. Every project will contribute to the protection, to the restoration of the European Green Belt. But we also have in our mind the other angle of sustainability, education, job creation, capacity building, empowerment of people, of municipalities. And together with awareness raising, these are also important pillars of our project. And I'm very glad that Nico Stefanuta will now tell us more about this angle. Nicola, good to see you. You have the floor. Good to see you, Jutta. You know, we in Romania, we be, believe a lot in faith. And uh, I think it was uh, a matter of uh, fate that we met at the breakfast you organized. Uh, I personally did not know that you're a first time MEP. You behaved so confidently. I was sure that you're a, a second term MEP, uh, but there, there we go. So we, we met at that breakfast in which we discussed about uh, the European Green Belt and it was eye-opening to me. But also I think the reason why I went there was because my father used to be, when he did his obligatory military draft service, he served on the current, uh, let's say, Romania part of the green belt, um, you know, and, and he, his job was something that was not very pleasant, was to try to identify people who are trying to cross the border by often by swimming across the Danube uh, to Yugoslavia and then further on. This is something very famous and, and known to Romanians. So uh, this, this project is a, it's a historical project that has many wounds and it's a very sensitive project, uh, not only from an environmental point of view, but also from a historic, cultural and, and um, European point, point of view. So that's what brought us together uh, that morning. And ever since, we worked together to, to make so, something out of it. And uh, it was very good that we, we drafted this pilot project later on and even better that we will continue this year uh, with uh, another pilot project for the continuation of the, of the initial one. Now, uh, I want to say that uh, it was very important to me to listen to, to Sofia and to the other speakers from before and to say that it is of paramount importance of what people do. Uh, of course, we are talking about biodiversity, about uh, conservation, about the, the environment, et cetera, but without, without any people on the ground, there's not much that is being done. The reason why I listened to Sofia with so much attention was that she said it herself. They started from a friend, friend group a group of friends, as simple as that. And then they turned it into an NGO that managed to get grants uh, worth, uh, if I calculated right, uh, more than a few million euros, uh, once 800,000 and other times at 800,000 from the LIFE program, et cetera. And it made me aware of the importance that we have as MEPs and as European deciders, decision makers, to provide those means to the few people who get the task and the courage to do something new in their country. Because in Romania, you know, speology and all this is not something that everybody does, not at all, it's far from it. Uh, and, and as Sofia said, there's very few people anyway left uh, because many um, might have left the country uh, in search of a better opportunity, etc. So we have to encourage the few people that are left to get, get involved into this. So that is why uh, in my part of the, the presentation, I would like to speak about the power of education and the power of young people to change the world we live in. Because I do believe that uh, a voluntary scheme for biodiversity and ecosystem 
services in Europe's um, uh, territories and uh, with help for uh, young volunteers or those looking for a job is something worth exploring. And that's what, that's what our, our, our pilot uh, uh, did and does. And I hope that we will see more of it in the continuation of this. For example, volunteers are, and job seekers from all over Europe and participating countries can have the possibility to apply via a platform to different projects across the European Green Belt. And uh, this work uh, could be used to explore the synergies between providing uh, ecosystem and biodiversity uh, services, uh, also uh, showcasing examples of climate change adaptation and mitigation measures. We are in the same fight uh, together, Utah, on this. And I do believe that uh, the purpose of pilots is to show best practices and best practice examples. Uh, and to, to, that they become an integral part and a permanent part of the EU budget. Uh, because uh, if we show achievement and contribute to the development of, of the areas, and if we connect uh, ecosystem preservation and restoration with information given perhaps to tourism, to sustainable tourism, traveling the Iron Curtain Trail, you also mentioned the bike trail, I do believe that we will make uh, the, the entire area more attractive and more well-known. Now, in Romania in particular, I'm, I'm very, very focused in getting young people involved in this because uh, there isn't much learning sources about uh, protecting biodiversity or uh, adapting to climate change and, and mitigating it. There is a growing interest from, from the younger generations. Um, all the data shows it, that the young people are very, very concerned about climate change uh, and, and biodiversity, uh, but there's very few resources to learn from it. So if we manage Utah to make this a learning tool and also a volunteering tool, and also perhaps a step way to a future job, career, or passion, I think we will be in a good good place to to start uh, to start making more more concrete uh, applications so of something that on paper looks extremely nice, but in reality still needs our help. Still needs our help. And while we are talking, uh, I was thinking that today in the Romanian news, um, the most important conversation is about infrastructure. It's about infrastructure. Of course, Romania wants to catch up with the rest of Europe in terms of infrastructures, ways, et cetera. But it also needs to catch up in terms of green infrastructure. And I'm going to, to fight very hard uh, with our government uh, and a minister that comes from my party, incidentally, to, to have this green infrastructure in the entire uh, thinking of, of the, the future of the uh, infrastructure of our country. So once again, Utah, I'm your partner for as long as this mandate uh, holds hope and, and as long as we will be together in politics. And I'm very happy to, to listen to the people who are on the ground and know much more than us of the realities of such a thing. And also they can tell us what is needed, what, what kind of, how can we help them uh, further do what they already do. Thank you very much, Nico, and I really enjoy working with you and um, hopefully we can have some further projects together. It's really a pleasure. And now without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Stefan Leiner from the European Commission, who will shed some light, so to speak, on the way the Commission is working on nature protection and then we will have Carol Martinez from the IUCN. And after that, we will get to the questions and the discussions. Stefan, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Jutta. And thank you very much for all the speakers. It's really a big pleasure for me to take part in this event as it brings together two of really very dear projects uh, that we have been following in the biodiversity unit on one side the best project, uh, which is trying to really unlock the potential for protecting and restoring biodiversity ecosystems and their services 
in what we call the true hotspots of the world when it comes to biodiversity, uh, which are the outermost regions and the overseas country, countries and territories. They are spread all over the world. They are places with uh, tropical forests, with coral reefs, with all kinds of really important habitats. And they also consist of uh, 150 islands or over 150 islands, which you know are particularly uh, threatened by climate change, by invasive alien species. So they really need all of our attention. And we have laws that are applicable to the EU, but we really lack also uh, our engagement uh, with those very important hotspots that uh, the outermost regions being part of the EU and the overseas countries and territories being part of the member states of the EU are still very important of our also European heritage. And, um, and then that's the best on one hand and uh, the, the, uh, the green belt on the other hand, which I always have been following with a very high interest because for me, that's one of the most striking and prime example of what a green infrastructure, what a trans-European nature network, what conserving and restoring biodiversity is really about. Uh, and also combining, as we have heard, our natural heritage with our cultural heritage. I think it's really an absolute prime project. And this best belt is really combining the two. And that's why uh, we have been uh, very interested in, in that. Um, Jutta, you said in your introduction that you would hope that biodiversity has more attention, and I fully agree with you, but I can also say that in these many years, as you also realized, I've been working on biodiversity in, at the European level. Never in my experience has been biodiversity as high on the political agenda in Europe, uh, at least in the Commission, but I also know in other parts in the Parliament. Um, and in the Commission with the European Green Deal, which is really uh, guiding all of the work of the European Commission, um, biodiversity is an essential and an integral part of it. And with the adoption of the EU biodiversity strategy uh, in May last year, I think we have set probably an unprecedented level of ambition in uh, protecting 30% of our land and sea, a third of which strictly protecting, in having really a true restoration agenda, looking at agriculture, forests, marine, wetlands, uh, invasive alien species, etc., creating the enabling environment that is necessary to achieve this ambition by working with businesses, by uh, also integrating the value of ecosystem in the service and decision making and by working with local actors, with local stakeholders, local authorities. And this is really also what the green belts will help, help us to do. Uh, and the fourth being, of course, our international agenda. We have a very important international meeting coming up, the 15th conference of the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity in Kunming in China in October this year, which is to set up a global framework for biodiversity. And here it was very important that Europe demonstrates that it's ready to lead by example through uh, proposing and then also endorsing uh, this strategy. And we look very much forward for the European Parliament, which is to adopt its resolution uh, under the uh, leadership of the rapporteur César Luena uh, very soon. And we hope that the Parliament will endorse and support this ambition that the Commission has proposed in its uh, communication. Um, so I just wanted to really stress uh, how important this is. Now, the best project, uh, as said, Caroline uh, will, Carol will present it a bit more in detail. But also that uh, we have been active for many years. It started uh, with a conference in the Réunion, which adopted also a, a resolution on that. And it is also thanks to the European Parliament that we made so much progress with the implementation of the BEST because uh, it is thanks to the financial support of preparatory action of other projects, pilot projects of the Parliament, that we could slowly build up BEST and then also use some additional funding from our, our development cooperation colleagues to, to make it end. We are I'm also very happy to say that BEST itself is now also secured in a more sustainable manner because the new life instrument 
will include uh, small grants, best projects uh, in outermost regions and overseas countries and territories. So we have secured that best will also be maintained in at least in the lifetime of the live instrument, which is uh, very welcome. Uh, I, before I hand over to, uh, to Carol, I just wanted to say that, um, that I also have a very good news. And that is that uh, only two days ago, the European Commission adopted its financing decision, which is confirming the implementation of the pilot project the Best Belt. So that means that right after the Easter holiday, we can really start in uh, putting everything in place to do the contractual arrangements so that this uh, pilot project can really start working. Um, you know, we sitting in Brussels doing our policies, we know very well that without the people like we, like Jakub, like Sofia, uh, who are working on the ground, uh, we would uh, do all our work for nothing because we need the people on the ground that are really doing the day-to-day -day work to protect and restore our valuable nature. And these are the people also working along uh, the green belt. And hence, it's a real pleasure for us to support this pilot project and also to make sure that we have more of these small grants, more of these initiatives on the ground happening. Thank you very much again. And with this, I hand over to Carol. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, good evening or good afternoon to all. It's a real pleasure for me to, to be here. Thank you for having me uh, f to this uh, very dear uh, event. Uh, for me, I'm more than delighted to, to see that uh, actually the best uh, initiative will pursue a journey with this um, Best Belt project and joining uh, the flagship Pan-European Green Belt Initiative and thus reaching actually a new bioregion. It's very encouraging. And actually, I would like to, to see how much it's, uh, it's great to see how this uh, experience has started with the EU versus will uh, have a, a great uh, follow up. And I would like to acknowledge here the real uh, pioneer role of uh, the EU versus all the autonomous region and the overseas countries and territories we have been working uh, with and for thanks to this uh, best project. Uh, it shows actually how um, uh, the European action can give great room for innovation, for adaptation to support uh, local stakeholders. So um, I would like to maybe remind what have been the objective of the BEST initiative before drawing the main lesson learned. Um, BEST uh, has been aiming definitely to facilitate uh, the access to European funds to all the stakeholders of the EU uh, overseas, so the nine autonomous regions and initially the 25 overseas countries and territories with a very uh, dear aim to increase their capacity, not only to access but actually to effectively manage uh, EU funds and thus to really highlight the key role they have as key ally of uh, the European but as well global biodiversity strategy and targets. To that end, the BEST initiative has been defined as a flexible scheme with a wide scope, but as well as a tailor scheme, letting definitely the local stakeholders to define their projects according to the needs of their territories, because as it was fairly said before, it's about people and work on the ground. And thanks to this tailor made approach, BEST has been able to offer a diversity of grants to address the, the diversity of the needs, but as well the diversity of the capacities. As uh, nicely underlined by Stefan, there are many low hanging fruits from uh, these best initiatives, um, the, the ecosystem profile, but as well the associated regional investment strategy. And here I would like to, to stress that what was really a key success factor was the participatory approach. All this work has been conducted hand in hand in close collaboration and consultation with the local stakeholders. And this is the fundamental to support ownership of future action to be undertaken and, and funded. 
to date, as you can see, the BEST initiative has been able to support uh, many projects and still uh, there will be new to come this year. And these projects uh, have been a uh, notable uh, impact and result in terms of uh, job creation, it was mentioned before, in terms of mobilization of the civil society, in terms of capacity building, training, giving a hand to uh, young people. Um, we had, for instance, project nicely combining biodiversity conservation, but as well social insertion. Um, it's all about as well raising awareness, developing environmental education, but of course, biodiversity uh, conservation and you can see here the impressive figures we have been able to achieve thanks to all these actors on the ground and despite the little amount of uh, the best uh, project or the i would say humble amount uh, what is important to underline here is that they have nevertheless been able to have a real leverage effect many of these projects many of these best projects have still tangible follow-up activities or development even after the time life of their uh, duration and as well have been able to induce new collaboration, new partnership after their own time life. So it's something too important how uh, small grants can actually induce real dynamic on the ground. So in a nutshell, what could be the main lesson learned or from such an uh, initiative? That definitely small grants can have an important impact, not only locally or nationally, but as well as the regional and European level. And this can have a real international importance, as, as you saw. And the small grants have a real mi multiplier effect. The diversity of needs and capacity requires as well a diversity of approach, a diversity of grants or a diversity of mechanism. And this can play nicely in synergy and complementarity with the other European funds or types of financial support. When they are empowered, the local stakeholders and citizens can make a real difference. And we can see, thanks to the, the BEST initiative, how we have been able actually to unlock the potential, how we have been able to uh, actually unlock real great new initiative in all these regions and territories. And this is very important for the implementation and the success of the EU biodiversity strategy. You can count on local stakeholders. What could be the key success factor? I would say definitely presence on the ground. I mean, this has been possible thanks to the fact that we are actually regional focal points. We are people knowing very well the regions, knowing very well the stakeholders, and thus being able to understand their needs and what was uh, actually uh, important to be funded. Another dimension is the availability of uh, regional or local expertise to assess and to monitor the success of the project funded. In this regard, something that is very important to do not underestimate it is the importance of the capacity building and monitoring activities of such of, uh, regranting mechanism. It's very important to be um, by the side of the stakeholders all along the time life of their project and even beyond. In this regard, again, I would like to come back to this dimension of the participative um, collaboration and the preparation of a pipeline of projects. Thanks to the ecosystem profile, thanks to the consultation, the discussion around the investment strategy, this has really given a good enabling condition for the stakeholders to brainstorm and to prepare good projects. And at last, but not the least, I would say make it as simple as possible, because what will count will be the activities on the ground. So I would like to thank you again very much and to congratulate uh, again very warmly this new uh, best belt. Um, be reassured that uh, we will be more than happy to share further our experience and we look forward to the new life small grant um, program happening. Thank you again very much.
Thank you so much, Carol. And I think that's there's, that's really a, an asset that we have already a project where we can look at what works, what does not work, how to approach people, how to work with stakeholders, what are the traps, what are the pitfalls, and um, because it's pretty useless to make one mistake twice, right? So <laughs> I guess um, there is already a lot of um, a lot of experience with this sort of work. Um, I have actually a question which is related to what you have just told us. Um, it's from Kirsi. Good afternoon from Montenegro and the Safe Salina case of community nature-based tourism development. Could you share examples of green jobs creation uh, along the belt with facts and figures? Wow, this is a task. Um, <coughs> I don't know whether any of um, whether you maybe Stefan can tell us something about it or who would feel. I think when it comes to facts and figures from the green belt, uh, probably Gabriel is, is better placed or the people who have that from the ground as uh, I mean, obviously. Uh, when we look at all the uh, fitness checks that we have done and all the other uh, assessments that have been done uh, recently on the value of our nature legislation, the value of biodiversity, uh, they have all uh, very much clearly uh, substantiated that uh, the economic outcomes in investing in the conservation and restoring of nature are much, 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 much bigger than the cost. So it's an absolute uh, high return on investment. And I would also uh, give your attention to a recent report that is called the Dasgupta Review that also uh, very, I think, elegantly uh, described all the scientific knowledge that we have on how also biodiversity is an essential engine of our sustainable economy. Uh, and the World Economic Forum uh, and Ursula von der Leyen, when she spoke to the World Economic Forum uh, this spring, she also made very clearly that the, the nature is now has to be at the heart, not only of environment policy, but of overall economic and, and recovery policy, as the, the huge amount of money we will now have in, a, available to invest in the recovery from the pandemic now is the moment to not invest them in again uh, in, in what I call negative incentives for biodiversity, but into positive incentives for biodiversity. So investing in, uh, in the protection and restoration of nature along the green belt is certainly something that we also should promote through our recovery programs that are not being set up by the members. Yes, I'm just looking for Wait, what happened now? Oh, okay. <laughs> My mic was open, therefore I could not open it. <laughs> Sorry. Another question would be um, on rebuild. Is the European Green Belt tra trying in this push to the EU by MEPs for a new European strategy to make tourism cleaner, safer, more sustainable, as well as get it back on its feet after the pandemic? Well, I think that was not what what we had in mind when when we actually started this project, Nico and I. But of course, that is also an angle which is important, which is also why I why I mentioned the Iron Curtain Trail, because that's really sustainable tourism. You go on your bike through nature. And um, I think that's we really synergies there because people that go on bike trips in their holidays usually are more interested in nature than those who don't. I, I haven't read statistics, but uh, I think it, it could prove possible. Um, maybe, Carol, do you know anything about, uh, could you tell us a bit about uh, synergies between the BEST project and tourism? Actually, we have been funding uh, several activities promoting and supporting uh, ecotourism. So whether it was in South Atlantic or in Pacific or even in, in the Caribbean and Indian Ocean, we have many different projects highlighting the importance 
of the ecotourism, and this has been able, enabling some sometimes small organization to really bloom and to share uh, the beauty of their territory or islands. So the support was mainly to make sure that uh, the visitors of the tourists were properly informed and to really uh, properly, I would say, guide them, uh, for instance, with new trails. Um, so it was um, quite different. Sometimes it was at the level of an island or at the level of an ecoregion. For instance, in the Pacific, we have been working at the level of a few territories, uh, thanks to a regional uh, organization, providing advices, but at, at the same time, implementing really on the ground, I would say, facilities and more safer, I would say, experience for the visitors again, to really uh, help these territories to further develop the ecotourism. So I have many examples, whether it's a direct, I would say, approach for tourism or indirect, when you, you want to make sure, for instance, that you are still preserving, for instance, amazing coral reefs uh, and mangroves. So yes, we have been working on, on tourism and ecotourism. No, it works. And I think this might be a question to Gabriel. Is there a comprehensive inventory of all species and communities living in the green belt, plants, animals, local communities? Yeah, thank you. Um, in, in fact, there is no comprehensive in, inventory. We have not gathered all the data from the very north to the very uh, south of the, of the green belt. Um, but uh, there are a lot of knowledge within all the, the actors uh, within the European Green Belt Initiative. Um, and um, as I have shown before, um, as the European Green Belt is crossing eight different biogeographic regions, we can assume that a lot of the European species, they are actually having their, their home also in the European Green Belt. But to be very clear, we don't have a comprehensive inventory showing all the all the species living there. Um, I, I just uh, would like to also comment on on the other question, and um, I'm I'm very grateful, um, Stefan, for your um, comment, which actually is, um, is is very clearly showing that investment in biodiversity conservation is paying back. And, and, and that is, that is um, somehow in, in, in contradiction to the narrative which is uh, more present because many people think that investment in biodiversity is more or less a waste of money. And we have to, to turn that a narrative and have to make people understand that the opposite is correct. And I think there are so many examples out there. We, we should spread the word more. And, and yeah, the Iron Curtain Trail was mentioned, and I think that is a fabulous idea. And this is a, a great synergy between the Iron Curtain Trail and the European Green Belt Initiative. And um, because the Iron Curtain Trail um, is, is bringing people um, to the Green Belt, um, make them, uh, give them the opportunity to ex experience uh, this great uh, natural and cultural values. And, um, and we have also some, some subsets of this Iron Curtain Trail, for example, the um, um, Amazon of Europe bike trail at the uh, Drava and, and Mura uh, River in this upcoming uh, pentalateral biosphere reserve um, in, uh, between Austria, Slovenia, Croatia, Hungary, and, and Serbia. So, so there are already a lot of these initiatives, smaller and bigger ones. And um, yeah, so I, I see the big potential, but uh, to be also very uh, clear, we do not have a, a full list with fact and figures and showing clear effects. Um, so yeah, we, we need to also refer to the more general reports and, and analysis. Yeah, thanks a lot. And just to, to complement on the inventory, I think it's um, it would have 
been very high expectations to have a complete in inventory of 12,000 kilometers, but th that's one of the ideas of our project, actually, that uh, because as Carol just told us, um, you discovered new species through the BEST project. And so now that we have the BEST belt project on our hands, we could have, um, I don't know the English word for it, Katien, Stefan, can you help me here? Katien. Uh, the conservationists nothing. do they hmm? nothing. nothing yeah um so we have the means for example for educating people that can who then can go out mapping plants mapping insects mapping um lands landscapes mapping biodiversity because um, mapping requires quite a bit of knowledge it has become much easier because um of these things here where you have um pretty little apps that help you with birds and bees and bugs and plants. Um, it's really astonishing what, what technology can do nowadays. So um, therefore, I would say, don't be too pessimistic by saying, well, you cannot tell the influence on, on biodiversity if you don't know the start po starting point. Well, what we do know is that we will acquire a lot of knowledge on the biodiversity of the green belt, and that's in val a value in itself, I believe. Um, and then someone wanted to know, Claudia wanted to know, how long is the project period of a best project? Is it the usual three years or fewer or longer? If I may, as I said, it depends of actually what are the capacities and the needs. And so the best project currently range from one year to three years. Uh, and we, um, during the implementation of the different call for proposal, we have witnessed that um, for small, um, small project, the average needed duration is around 16 to 18 months. Okay. But you can do already a lot with uh, during this uh, this duration. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, there is an interesting question from Itri. What is the position of the initiative towards possible partnerships with conservation CSO in Thrace part of Turkey, as we have shared populations and habitats to restore and rewild? Who would like to answer on this? I'm not sure whom the question was addressed to. Well, if, if I may, I, I could um, jump in here. Uh, well, in, in fact, we, we have also in the European Green Belt Association, we have a member from Turkey um, and we have quite some, uh, some contacts with uh, Turkish colleagues. And um, yeah, so sure, we, we also want to, to cooperate more uh, with um, CSOs from, from Turkey. And there's a lot of cooperation already ongoing between colleagues um, from Bulgaria and Turkey and also Greece. Yeah, sounds, sounds very promising. <laughs> and there is also a question. Oh, wow. It's, this is not a Question, it's more remark, I guess. During the development of the Iron Curtain Tray, we experienced how difficult it can be to get local municipalities and regional authorities on board. I'd be curious what your approach is in that regard. Well, I guess, Gabriel, you, all, you also have some experience on that, right? Yeah, we have some experience and, and um, also, also others. Maybe, Jakob, you can also comment, or, or Sofia, or... Um, also others in, in the webinar, because I assume that, that many of the colleagues are also uh, participating in the webinar. Um, and it depends a lot on, on people, actually. And it's a lot about um, relationship. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a long time to go. And it's yeah. a, long, a long way to go. And you cannot simply come in and say, now we do it. But um, yeah, first is to build trust and then develop ideas together and listen uh, to what uh, local communities actually need and then um, develop ideas together. So that is how I would um, look at this. But it's a challenge, certainly. Yeah, sure. 
And a more general question, maybe Sofia could help us there. Um, Bulgaria, how is functioning ecotourism in COVID situation in best areas? As you have been working with a lot of very different people over, over time. And also, if I understood you correctly, you are doing tourism in your beautiful caves, right? Yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what the situation in Bulgaria is due to COVID. I know they have faced some difficult situations, but you know, the rules change from one day to the next. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I would say that people who are involved in tourism will continue to do what they do. But if the authorities announce, for example, a curfew, because right, right now in Romania, we have a curfew at eight o'clock in the evening. Mm. Yeah, that can hinder you really bad. And also, I think that the vast majority of hotels are closed. Yeah, which is so, a chance for ecotourism yeah. because like, if people really... take their tents or go mm -hmm. to rather small, small um, houses where where there only one yeah, one but guest most, or one most family. Accommodation, I mean, except for some very big hotels in Bulgaria, most accommodation I know is closed as okay. of today. Yeah. Well, I th maybe it was more a, um, a more general question how ecotourism works in in COVID uh, under COVID restrictions. But actually, I believe that um, tourism in general, of course, is dreadfully affected. But ecotourism might be less affected than um, climbing into a plane with 300 other people and going to a hotel with 5,000 other people, so to speak. So um, when you're about on your own, maybe even have your tent on your bike, that tends to be better manageable than um, mass tourism, so to speak. Well, of course, it is also much safer than mass tourism. But yeah, but it all depends on how the regulation regulations change from one day to the next yeah it's uh, that seems to be the same in every country and mm -hmm. um, people are really being fed up with illogical rules and um yeah i think uh well this is a totally different issue and if i start talking about it now i only get into a get into an anger and <laughs> this should not be <laughs> okay Yes, there is. Uh, there's. We had f quite a few questions and comments on illegal logging. So, Nico, I think you you are really active in that field. So, therefore, I would like to give you the floor on this issue. Yes, we in Romania experience a huge frustration because we see hundreds and hundreds of lorries of of transporting wood and i've just listened to i don't know if you were in that seminar too um utah on on uh, on uh, forests that happened yesterday and today and i heard that as much as a third of all european wood is not known as a source it's not traced and that is a, a huge shame on our part that means we are not doing things properly in the european union I know that there have been some advances uh, on uh, tracking. I know that SUMAL 2.0 system was also reintroduced in, in Romania, but uh, until the tracking is done properly, we, we, we don't really have a, a clear way to say what is legal and what is not. Secondly, I am with you on anything that blocks uh, exploration, uh, exploitation, I'm sorry, in uh, natural growth uh, uh, forests. You know, Utah, we have a big fight uh, every time there is a, a forest file in the European Parliament. Then we have the entire lobby of sustainable forest uh, management that comes to the front uh, and that denies the European competence in this field. And I'm very furious that this happens uh, every single time. Uh, because people expect us to act. And uh, I would like to see not only us as politicians act more because we do have a competence. I believe that is explicit because of the environmental uh, competence of the union. But also I think our law enforcement agencies have a competence and uh, people who are desperate from illegal 
the Carpathian Trail. We'd like to see also law enforcement agencies of the European Union, such as OLAF or EPPO, be more active into this area. And I'm, I'm uh, with you, a uh, supporter of the, uh, of the recognition of environmental crimes as well. Uh, that is a new field of work and uh, a new field that, that's, that's getting more and more ground. So to wrap it up, there's a lot of frustration coming from, from countries along the Carpathian Trail for uh, illegal logging activities that happen uh, sometimes also in Natura 2000 sites, in protected sites, in uh, natural growth forests, etc. Uh, that Romania is very rich for. And uh, we have to differentiate things and tell our Nordic friends that, that uh, it is one thing uh, to have their reality uh, over there and it's another, it's another reality, uh, something that happens um, in, uh, in, in some of our countries, a reality that some of them are really not aware. You have to bring examples from the outside. When we talk about imported deforestation, for instance, on that file, where we try to punish uh, countries uh, outside of the union for their practices, but they don't know that environmental crimes like this happen also inside the union. I sometimes feel it's almost like a cultural war that people are not aware of this. And uh, I've been passing my mandate so far in explaining and telling them we need more European action. And uh, I hope we, we will be able to achieve this year in the Environment Committee on the two, two uh, forest files that we will have before us uh, to have something more significant, more significant action and not always being stuck at the issue of competence of of uh, uh, and others that that are often brought to the to the fore. Thank you very much, Nicholas. And um, now we have it's already six o'clock. So I would like to thank our distinguished speakers for being with us today, for sharing your experiences and your insight and all your knowledge and. Thank you very much, Stefan. And having the financing is really, really good news. Thanks for sharing this. It makes my weekend all the better. Um, as said, everyone um, agreed that they would share their slides and we will put them up on our website. So anyone who wants to um, look at them again can just download them. And we will also um, bring the video will upload the video. So if you have friends or colleagues who did not have time to watch right now, they can um, watch afterwards and um, everything will be preserved. As to the questions, of course, we were not able to answer all the questions, but um, we will see that we can come back to the most pressing ones, um, I guess, when it comes to the common agricultural policy, that would be worth at least five further webinars. And so we might not want to answer that in detail. And um, the parliamentary position is already voted on. So um, the super trilogue is running today and I'm also very anxious on its outcome because it's so important for biodiversity. I'll just make the tour the table. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, G Carol. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Jakob. And thank you, Nicola. And please, let's not forget thanks to our teams in the background who have organized all this, who have made practice sessions and who have sorted the questions and kept everything up and running until six o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Thanks so much. Stay safe, everyone. Stay healthy, everyone. And I hope to see you soon again in person. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice weekend.